Hey everyone. Back for the back for the big event. Our annuals open source survey that the new stack does with the Linux Foundation, the to do group there. I am joined by Chris Anisic of the CNCF. Chris, here we are again. How are you? Hey, how's it going? Sorry, got a little audio hiccup. Um, good to be here. Uh, happy to have an opportunity to talk about our latest uh, open source survey, uh, program survey uh, results from the Tudor Group. Definitely. And these are different times we're in, Chris, aren't they? It's a, here we are virtually. We could have been uh, in Austin under other circumstances. I'm sure that's kind of a hacky, cliche thing to say right now. Definitely. I, I would have appreciated uh, walking to the conference venue, uh, you know, instead of not being on an airplane, but I'm thankful that we're uh, home and healthy and are able to uh, spread, uh, you know, wonderful OSPO open source program knowledge uh, to the world today. OSPO open source program knowledge. Yes, that is what we're here for. And I'll just take a minute to talk a little bit about the new stack. The new stack has been doing this research with the with Chris over the past three years. And so we're starting to have some baseline understanding. If you're not familiar with us, the new stack provides explanation and analysis of at scale development, deployment and management. We primarily serve a readership of developers, engineers, DevOps and IT professionals. We like to think of ourselves as a trusted resource, and we try our best to provide that through the explanation the analysis that we provide. You can go to newstack.io for more about us. Now, let's get into the data, just some basics. We conducted this survey over the time frame of May to June of 2020. They were solicited through social and email lists. We had about a thousand people responding. 672 completed the survey and 17 responses were excluded. What I'd like to say is that these numbers are, are, are less than we've seen in prior years. Um, we had uh, uh, some um, uh, challenges in actually getting to the 1000 number total, but it does equal 2018 numbers. And We've been trying to find some reason for that, and I, I attributed in part, I think, just to the times we're in. And Chris, I don't know if you have any any other thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, you know, the, the, our thesis of essentially we would see uh, lar a larger survey turnout uh, due to everyone staying at home definitely did not play out. I'm, I'm assuming just you know with the challenging times everyone's operating in. Um, it's it's kind of hard to kind of get everyone's attention on a, a specific uh, thing, but uh, overall we still received uh, a lot of responses, and it's enough responses to try to uh, deduce some interesting, uh, you know, uh, takeaways uh, from the results. I would say that Chris is pretty active on the GitHub site, and that's where actually you can find all the data, and that's at GitHub.com. You can see the link there to do group survey, so you can go there and uh, see the full results and, and slice and dice them as you wish. So we now are building this baseline. We're building this capability to see some, some numbers. I remember last year when we were in Lyon, Chris, and you were saying, oh, well, you know, we're still a little early here in the data collection. We're still trying to understand a little bit more about what's going on here, but I think we're starting to see some, I don't know if you would call it benchmark information, but I think it's getting closer to that. I think you'll see it in the numbers that we have. There are some fluctuations, um, but but number one, there's this widespread adoption. You know, we are seeing that more than half of the companies out there are, are saying that they have open source programs. Now they're in various stages of development. We've seen established programs like VMware, for instance, with with Dirk over there, Dirk Handel, and, and what he's done. And he's really actually been able to make a lot of real, I think, substantive changes to the overall kind of vision for VMware and how they are uh, changing their views and how they're changing their perspectives about open source. They've made a number of acquisitions as well. 
And so that plays into it. And as well, I will have to mention VMware as a sponsor, and they were the sponsor of this survey as well. The CNCF is a sponsor, as is the Linux Foundation after the time. Now, I don't know, Chris, is that, is that, would you basically say that now we're seeing this summary data? I mean, not quite benchmark. What, what are you still waiting for? You know, I, I think, you know, the whole idea of putting this survey together was to formalize essentially uh, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, essentially, you know, a lot of companies that we've interact with are, you know, experimenting with open source, establishing open source programs. And, and there was never kind of data out there on, you know, uh, how large are they? What are open source programs used for? And so the idea was always to kind of, you know, have some kind of thing we could reference as an organization, given that the Tudu Group essentially is an organization of peers who have built or are building out open source programs across the industry. So our idea was always just to have concrete data we could point to, because a lot of times when people are kind of early in their open source program journey, whether it's a formal OSPO or informal, they're always like, well, how is it done at potentially another organization? How large is their OSPO? How many people should I hire? Should I just have one? Should we just keep it informal? And so on. So just having more data that we kind of share based on the trends of what's going on in industry is very useful um, you know, for people as they're trying to figure out staffing and also benefits, given that um, each OSPO tends to have different purposes depending generally how the business works. So, you know, some OSPOs are very heavily compliance focused because they're shipping, you know, you know, millions of devices and software on those devices. So they're distributing software. So compliance tends to be a little bit more paramount. Our kind of more newer age, you know, web companies where they're distributing less software on physical devices, uh, it's less of a compliance thing and more of a, you know, how do I ensure that I get ROI from software that we're contributing to or investing or open sourcing um, ourselves, you know, you mentioned VMware as a kind of a example, OSPO, but there's other organizations out there like Spotify, or, you know, Google with Chris Debona and so on that, you know, are kind of, you know, more of our web companies focus and they're really trying to either improve their brand, improve how efficient their engineers are developing and so on. So this is just, it really provides us a, a data set every year we can reflect upon and say, here's how things are changing. Here are maybe new industries. Here were some needs that we kind of focus on. And we share everything public. That link you mentioned earlier, everyone every year could open up issues on our GitHub repo, ask, you know, ask questions, modify questions, and do whatever they want um, and participate with us. Excellent. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about the to-do group because they actually have had an important role in, in, in the development of open source program models. Sure. I mean, we, we initially started the organization a little over five years ago. It's been informally running for longer than that when essentially uh, a handful of us that were running open source programs at the time, mostly in the Bay Area. Uh, we had companies, you know, like Twitter, which I was, there's Google, Facebook, Dropbox, and so on. We're sharing basically a lot of information of, you know, how did you deal with this problem? How did you, you know, what tooling did you do to, you know, help improve you know, uh, and measure ROI for your open source project. So we kind of started informally. We eventually formalized the organization uh, and brought it to the Linux Foundation to provide a neutral home, you know, for us and kind of handle all the back office stuff and essentially decided to let's go spread the notion of, you know, open source program management uh, to the industry, given that it's kind of a new new field or new type of job, you know, description, why not have a, you know, single body that's responsible for stewarding, you know, uh, what an OSPO is, how it runs and sharing practices uh, amongst each other. And, you know, uh, it's been fairly successful. We have a great set of guides that we produce that, you know, show how you start an open source program to how you potentially retire a project that, you know, uh, may not be popular anymore. How do you run your events and so on. So um, overall, I think we've done uh, a great job. And I think we're all firm believers that, you know, if you go back, you know, 20 years or so ago, I think, I think it was in, in, in 1995, when the first um, uh, chief security officer w w was essentially crowned or created, right. And, and, and they were essentially dealing with security issues at the time, but it was very early stage. I still think we're in the early stages of open source program management where more and more companies are gonna have chief open source, you know, people, directors of open source and so on. And that will continue to grow just like security um, grew as a center of competency for, for companies. Open source is gonna be a necessary center of competency given how much open source is being used. I mean, we saw from Heather Miller's keynote today that it's, you know, all the data shows that 98% of software, you know, shipped these days has 
open source, you know, Im embedded in it uh, for, for the majority of it. So we're only going to continue to that trend. So you're going to need open source program offices to help manage that for organizations. Yeah, and I think that that's reflected, I think, in the funding in many ways. It is stable now. There's some caveats to that, but let's, so let's get into the more of the details of the research. And so we're going to look at some trends and especially around program office adoption. Uh, one of the fine, one of the things I get out of this is that, you know, now that we do have three years of data, we are seeing people using open source. There's no question. It's a, the, I think the, the median right there mean is about 82%, really, if you look at that first, in the first number. So that, to me, that seems like that, that, that's not going to go down, right? That, that number, I think, is, is fairly rec, them numbers like showing that, yes, you know, open source contributions are seriously important to organizations and, and, and people are consuming open source code in, in products or services. Yeah, no, de def. I mean, it, it's it's interesting where I think this number should literally be like 99% or 100%. It's, it's hard for me to find any piece of software these days that is, does not have some open source bit associated with it. But, you know, everyone... You know, there are some industries out there that are, are different and things are closed source, but I, I do expect the consumption number to continue to kind of increase uh, over time. Uh, and, and on the production side, as more open source is used, eventually more companies will contribute upstream. And, you know, I think if we look at the data, we're seeing a small uh, uptick in that. I think one of the goals for the to-do group and I suppose in general is to ensure that number kind of continues so we could kind of ensure that, you know, uh, if you look at the research out there, if companies contribute to stuff they depend on, it does help influence uh, business um, results. And I think in general, that's the true key to open source sustainability is to ensure companies and organizations contribute to software that they uh, depend on. So in, in, other, in the other kind of questions, I looked at, you know, the data about collaborating, contributing, initiating, or influencing open source project. And again, it seems like we are reaching some some um, reflection that there's some that there's some data. The data there shows that there isn't going to be major aberrations in what we think about. Like for the data about collaboration, um, you know, for instance, it's uh, it's one of the larger questions that marks you know how we're thinking about participating in open source organizations. A lot of this too, I think, reflects how uh, influential the open source communities have been that have had a, a higher profile external to open source program offices, which helps kind of reflect on, you know, the, the actual recognition of open source and the recognition of open source program offices. Definitely. Would you, uh, would you add anything to that about the, uh, about the collaboration yeah. with peer across open source projects or foundations? I would think that the, that the foundation, uh, the foundations have had a part in this. I mean, we we base a lot of our coverage on projects, for instance, that we're following out of the open source. It, yeah. I mean, found, foundations are there basically just to serve behind the scenes. You know, any any project or you know thing that gets large enough, you want a neutral entity or a fair you know uh, set of rules to collaborate. Right? Businesses are inherently kind of cutthroat and you know, compete in, in, in the market. And if the rules aren't fair for people to collaborate on a project, whether it's something like Kubernetes, which is widely used or something like Linux, uh, it, the rules, you know, co companies don't don't want to collaborate if the rules are fair. It's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, the analogy would be, you know, a sports match, you know, maybe you play, you know, uh, baseball, right? And if the rules were somehow, you know, set up in a way where one team or is able to have more people on the field than in other, like, you know, why would you play that game, right? I kind of view foundations in a similar role where they're there to kind of really enforce fair governance and, and kind of keep kind of the IP clean so companies could actually build commercial solutions or, 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 or safely build products on top of things without without worrying it. The, the really cool little bit, um, you know, that I kind of think here is I'm seeing more and more end user companies out there contributing open source projects and doing new stuff. For example, um, a company called Spotify, which I'm sure many of you, you know, have used or heard of, uh, has developed some really cool developer portal technology called Backstage. Uh, essentially, it serves as their in-house, you know, developer portal that hooks up all their different tools. And they decided to just share it 
with the world. So if you go to backstage.io, you could check it out. But you know, they're essentially a music streaming company, you know, but they decided to share what they built with everyone to help get others improve to to improve it. Because you know, it's not in their line of business. So what intellectual property really there is related to music streaming. They're just trying to improve how the developers build the software. So I think you're going to continue to see more and more that trend of end users out there, you know, not traditionally vendors contributing more uh, code out there to collaborate with uh, peers in the industry. Yeah, and I think it's important to, to point out that it's not entirely altruistic either. I mean, they've had to like create their own tools in, in many times. I mean, if you look at the history of, of open source over the past five to 10 years, a lot of the ASCAL companies just couldn't use off the shelf tools. And so they started building projects and they needed people who were their peers to be participating as well so they could get some feedback from us. Exactly. I mean, you look at a project like Envoy that came from Lyft, right? You know, Lyft is scooters and, you know, uh, ride sharing. And they were not happy with Nginx at that time because there were certain features that they couldn't get out of the Pro Edition um, and the Open Source Edition that they couldn't contribute back up because it was in the Pro Edition. So they're like, let's go build something from scratch. And Envoy was born. And then Envoy is a, you know, a, a service slash reverse proxy that is used all over you know, uh, the place these days. So it kind of just shows how an end user that may not be happy with their existing, you know, vendor relationship or tool they're using, like, hey, we could build it ourselves. You know, is I think this all goes to the trend of, you know, you know, digital transformation and companies becoming software companies. As you know, you build out a software competency, you're gonna start to build cool solutions that solve problems for you that may solve problems for others that you decide to share. Um, and we are starting to see some interest among companies that are not necessarily at scale consumer internet technology companies such as Spotify or Lyft, we're starting to see companies who may be in more business settings having a much larger role for open source and initiating projects and participating in projects. I think of Bloomberg as an example in the financial sector. No, absolutely. I mean, you saw from today's keynote from Gab from the uh, FinTech Open Source Foundation or FinOS is they're essentially getting all these, uh, say, traditional, very traditional finance, uh, heavily regulated companies, a safe place to collaborate and share uh, software and, and ideas. So, yeah, I think you're, you're definitely, um, definitely right with that point. Is there any data here from this year and this first slide that you think is noteworthy or interesting that you'd like to that you'd like to highlight? Uh, just the simple trend of more companies contributing to upstream and releasing new projects. I think that's just reflective of kind of what we see uh, in public. I think other than that, that's no surprises as, as far as I'm called, uh, as far as I, as, as far as I could see. Great. So we're looking at the top open source activities in the in enterprise and one of the things that we still see time and time again is compliance and com how compliance is still a focus for uh, for open source program offices. Now, in this in, this, in these results, we are seeing that open source code is being used internally quite a bit. Uh, they use it to you know at least some of the time. It's like you know I think how the question was was asked and. So when you think about that, then that compliance makes sense, doesn't it, Chris, in terms of it? Because they yeah. have to make sure that they're using the right versions of everything else. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just a, it's a legal thing at, the, at this issue to ensure that you're compliant, right? You're using software under a specific license, and you have to ensure that from a legally, you know, kosher point of view, you uh, comply with those uh, terms. So, yeah, I mean, compliance is always going to be a focus of... Uh, a lot of open source, um, you know, program management, program management, making that process a lot more efficient for engineering teams and so on, I think is also uh, kind of an important goal. But yeah, I mean, this is this the, the, this is no surprise here as, as far as I'm concerned. The contributing uh, code upstream is super interesting. Um, you know, I think that is growing over time, you know, from my discussions with a lot of companies out there, uh, you know, not enough companies contribute stuff upstream. Um, you know, a lot of companies just kind of go on about their lives and, you know, just do what they need to. It's, it's you know, open source is usually all mutual self-interest at the end of the day, but I really like to see that that number uh, improve um, over over time. Yeah, it's 51%, it's so it's, it's 
gone past that halfway point. Yeah. The, it, but that's also reflected in the 70% of companies who are regularly including open source in their products, right? So, yeah. you know, if they're using open source in their products and they're going to, they should be participating upstream to some extent, yeah. right? Yeah, How absolutely. But it is a Go ahead. Yeah, no, it, I mean, it's it's a cultural change for companies to contribute upstream. Uh, it, it's not easy. There's generally sometimes legal dances and other things that are done. So for companies from a more traditional setting, uh, it, it, it takes time, so. And a lot of this data I see, go, there's things that go, that, that go hand in hand, like I was mentioning before. Like if you're gonna be just being upstream projects prior to COVID-19, you'd be traveling to conferences because you'd be meeting with people, you'd be talking to them. I, on the end user question, because we're focusing a lot on end users at the new stack, and we find that the end user stories are really interesting. We we talk to the you know Wikimedia, and uh, you know which runs Wikipedia, and there's there's all kinds of scaling issues that they're having. You know, for instance, because they might you know the, people may not know it, but the Wikimedia actually runs you know the you know the Wiki software that is used by tiny organizations and very large organizations and is used in Wikipedia itself. And so when you're, so now they're, they're, they're thinking of all kinds of issues around scale and, and Wikimedia is, is quite involved in the C, in, in, you know, in, in the Kubernetes community and the CNCF and the cloud native ecosystem. Do you have any perspective you can provide about what kind of increases you're seeing in the CNCF around cloud native projects in terms of end users participation? I mean, I think in general, more end user companies are participating in open source uh, projects. It's not just traditionally vendors, which has kind of been the history of, of open, you know, open like massive open source participation. Like I mentioned before, you have companies like Lyft, uh, you have uh, Uber, Spotify, uh, the banks, uh, Bloomberg, like, a, a, like these organizations are all finding ways to participate in, in the upstream because they've realized the pain that, you know, if, if you're not part of contributing upstream, it's hard to influence the direction of, you know, a, a project in, in my perspective. Okay, well, I was, did I skip one? No, this is the next slide here. Um, yep. You know, I, I they, people have these open source program offices. They're gonna create, they're looking to increase adoption. They're looking to promote open source culture improve license compliance. There's some interesting kind of variations in this data if you look at it on GitHub. That shows, for instance, that, you know, the, we'll get to this in a minute, but how the open source program offices are actually narrowing their focus to try to be more, you know, just so they can do more with what they have. Um, but this, again, is information here that shows that open source is part of organizations. It hasn't changed much in three years. I, I think we can pretty much kind of summarize it. This is what we've been talking about for the past 10, 15 minutes. Is there anything else you'd add yeah, here? Absolutely. No, I, I think it just kind of shows that companies are, you know, having open source programs, uh, whether they're formal or informal, and they're creating policies to kind of ensure that, you know, uh, uh, their organization runs more efficiently from creating progress pr products to other engineering uh, practices. Yeah, so I think we can move on. Now, there's some interesting, there's some data here that uh, that I think is, is interesting though because it does show that for instance that we're starting to see more focus again on on the program offices overall now you might look at this data for instance and say oh look owning and overseeing execution of open source strategy it has gone from 67 percent to 53 percent which is a healthy drop but when you look at the data a little bit more closely You'll notice that, first of all, there was some um, there's some there's some more focus in these offices, but the but still the open source offices are participating in the open source programs. They are part of the strategy, but as this but as the number of projects increase, you can't do it all. You have to be able to focus on you know on the core values of the organization. Yeah, I mean, it, it's this data is kind of a, a little bit variable in some places where compliance seems to have like ping pong back and forth. And there's been kind of a decrease of, you know, owning, you know, overall execution of open source strategy. And I think part of that is every open source office is a little bit different, right? Obviously, the informal ones are not going to be, 
fully, you know, in control of open source strategy that may be delegated down to the actual business unit and kind of the informal open source program is there to kind of assist to ensure, you know, practices are being followed, compliance is, you know, uh, being respected and, and, and so on. So it's, it's kind of interesting to, you know, uh, see the data because, you know, in some ways, since open source is becoming super commonplace, a lot of the business units or products, you know, are kind of owning, you know, uh, some of the overall direction of whether, you know, uh, their stuff will be open source or parts of it will be, um, you know, open source. And that open source program really serves as a kind of a, a service role, um, you know, to the organization versus actually overseeing the whole strategy for, for, for the organization. But we'll see, that's just a thesis. We'll, we'll kind of, you know, it'll be interesting to kind of dive in the data in the future to see how that's reflected across different industry verticals and, and so on. So I'm kind of excited to dive into that um, later. We have a question actually, and I thought we should just ask it because we, you know, we don't have a lot of time. And uh, it comes from uh, Mo Shojaje, who's asking, what are your recommendations for government sector software and cloud-based services? And I think he's probably asking uh, about open program offices in particular and open source technology. Yeah, I think, in, so, so there's two things here. One, um, you know, I'm a, uh, so, uh, there are governments out there that, you know, like the Canada, UK, uh, kind of have open source program offices within kind of their digital services uh, organization. So I think as a government entity, having some type of uh, office for, you know, whether, you know, it's a digital transformation, whatever you want to call it, something that's kind of dedicated into improving the consumption of open source within a government organizations is important. Um, you know, I'm a firm believer that you know, uh, tax-based revenue or, or revenue that's essentially used to build software in a government setting, that stuff should be open source to, to begin with. And so having some body to help uh, improve that is important. You know, there has been work um, out there by certain uh, organizations within, at least in the U.S., there has been a uh, source, uh, uh, an open source policy that they've open sourced for all the government to ensure that, you know, some level of software that they're building is actually open source. Uh, France uh, has also been developing a kind of generic open source policy to be used by um, the, uh, you know, EU uh, member countries that you could find online. Uh, but yeah, I think in, in general, like having, you know, a, an open source program for a government, it should be no different really from, you know, uh, in a company, you just, you're just optimizing for different things. For a government, you generally want to optimize the production and usage uh, of open source software to either save money for your constituencies and, and so on. So hopefully that answers your question, but I, I will send out some information with kind of links for those policies for, for governments, but yeah. Yeah, we should, we have, given that we have a few minutes left, Alex, maybe we'll kind of wrap up on kind of one um, uh, one point. Maybe I, I think given it's time, it's COVID times, maybe we should wrap up the last uh, point regarding the funding levels. Um, I believe that's, uh, yeah, th th there it is. <laughs> so uh, yeah. I, I it, it's been interesting, at least, you know, um, with with my CNCF hat on and cloud cloud native hat on, I, I've actually seen an acceleration of people and organizations out there accelerating the move to cloud and spending more money to kind of get there uh, with the thesis that they're going to save money in, in the long run. Uh, I think open source is a huge part of that journey. I think we've seen in general that uh, even though um, you know, we're living in very kind of unique pandemic times, there is a desire to increase uh, funding for open source programs in these times. Most people are neutral uh, and very few people are looking kind of, um, you know, decrease around around 10%. So uh, I, I think in general, open source tends to be very counter cyclical when it comes to tough economic times. If we looked at the last recession, things like Red Hat, you know, boomed and open source companies in general were seeded a lot of the time that have done extremely well. Uh, you know, these days, given all the kind of open source, you know, IPOs out there, such as Mongo and Elastic and so on. So uh, I, I think we'll see similar things where companies are going to step back and look to invest more in uh, ways to optimize how they do engineering and other cost efficiencies that they could look for. And open source is going to be a huge uh, part of that, in, in my opinion. Yeah, just uh, some vertical industry data that we haven't uh, had time to yet put into, uh, you know, into this survey. But it, for instance, I mean, you were talking earlier about, you know, uh, vertical industries that are increasing their usage of open source software. Our data actually showed that 42% of the 31 healthcare respondents said they are at least sometimes contributing upstream. And that in 2019, that figure was 23%. And 
we think we can contribute attribute that to the COVID-19 projects. Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to slice the data once we fully open source it out there. So um, I look forward to kind of getting that done, given that we're kind of, uh, I think we hit our time uh, limit as far as I'm concerned. Maybe not. I thought we had 30 minutes. Maybe you correct me. <laughs> I, I'm just going to keep going until they tell us to. Let's to, do it. To, Let's to, do to it. Kick, until they kick us off the stage. Um, so Let's top five. Better than, what? The top Let's five. Do minutes, Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. The top five benefits for existing programs in 2020, um, uh, increased innovation, awareness of open source, uh, and commercial dependencies. One thing that I, that I think is interesting, and maybe this will change this year, is that I, I, I think of open source program offices have historically been almost like knowledge management, um, groups. They actually have, they have so much m knowledge that they, they have. And traditionally, knowledge management groups don't get a lot of funding. And I think it's true of open source program offices. They haven't had significant amounts of funding. And that then affects their visibility internally, um, at an, you know, inside of an organization, inside of an organization. Yeah. Is that changing? Do you think that we're start going to start to see more, more bigger budgets and more visibility at a higher level? It's so mixed across the board. I mean, if you look at like an organization like Google or Intel, they spend tons and tons of money on huge amounts of staff. Uh, other organizations tend to be a little bit smaller. Sometimes it's individual or it's part time. I think, you know, I don't want to look at it purely from like a fiscal perspective. I, I'd like to look at more from like an impact perspective, like what, you know, what, what does an open source organization, you know, what impact does it have for the overall, you know, organization in terms of like, you know, uh, either efficiency or, you know, what they're able to kind of uh, impact from like a business results perspective. So I don't think that's always inherently tied how well funded uh, an organization is, but, you know, we'll, we'll see how the data, you know, changes year over year. I'll be curious to see how things evolve po in the post kind of COVID uh, era and, and see if truly the, the theor theory that open source is a counter cyclical uh, thing during, during tough times. And we'll see if there's more investment. I don't know. We're still very early. We did the survey in May and June. So, you know, understand that that at that specific time slice of the pandemic, that's the kind of data that we are, are working with. Right. Again, I mean, I talked about the challenges, um, awareness and support. Uh, this is what people are saying. Um, budgets, uh, influencing open source projects, internal awareness of the programs. Um, we need to wrap up in just a minute, so we're going to have to run, but um, I think maybe just in conclusion, we should just say, hey, this has been another year for another uh, another example of the of the advancement of open source. Um, I'll wait to see if that actual 82 percent number goes up to 99 percent uh, to Chris and and how that will affect the other numbers. Um, but it seems like we're on a, we're, we're still on an upward increase. It does seem that there is some kind of like. I don't know, um, like, like some flatness in open source program offices and, and in terms of like, I'm looking to see what's going to like help them get to that next level. Maybe in conclusion, you can help us understand that because it's so critical to open source overall and enterprise organizations. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is an awareness thing. I think a lot of companies don't understand the needs for formal open source program management unless they felt pain, whether it's a compliance thing or, you know, something that an engineer uh, done. I mean, I, I think the, the analogy I use go back to how, you know, uh, secu uh, chief security officers and security offices, um, you know, were formed. It wasn't until I think the mid 90s where the first one was formed and that was due to security incidents. And over time, almost every organization now has someone responsible for security because they probably have felt some pain, right? And I think, you know, a similar pattern will will play over time with open source program offices where companies will uh, learn from their peers in the industry and they may have felt pain that they're like, oh my gosh, we had a compliance issue. We need to establish an open source program office or, oh, cool, look, another organization out there, um, you know, has uh, an open source program. So uh, we're going to learn from what they did. But on that, I look forward to, you know, collaborating with you in the future and everyone can kind of see the results on tutogroup.org. Just find it on our GitHub. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Thank you very much. Thanks to uh, the Open Source Summit for having us today. We look forward to more research on this topic. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks.